Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cafe Lena. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Um, I, my name is Sarah Craig. I'm the director of Cafe Lena. And I want to start by wishing you all happy Peace Week. Thank you for taking part in it. So I want to start out by saying just a few words about the purpose of Cafe Lena's community classroom series. This event tonight is not only part of Peace Week, but is part of Cafe Lena's community classroom series. We created this series to do two things. One, better understand the human story of our community. And two, to see if we can build a healthier civic sphere through the arts. Folk music, the music that Cafe Lena is known for, makes songs out of our lives as workers, lovers, dreamers, outcasts, failures, and better world builders. Folk music considers our lives to be worth singing about, and it invites everyone to sing along. It takes place in small rooms like this one and around campfires and in places of worship and as people work and march together. Through the songs that have been sung in this room since 1960, our hearts and imaginations have been open to the stories of people who were strangers or invisible to us or possibly even our enemies. This series has addressed various aspects of mass incarceration, issues around housing, opioids, food insecurity, healthcare access, policing, and much more. In each case, very importantly, the discussion leaders were not just policy experts you would hear in the halls of power, but also people directly affected by the issue. In this way, our classrooms are in keeping with the spirit of folk music. These events are not academic undertakings rooted in theory and the scientific method. These events are not city hall meetings rooted in our adversarial justice system where you're the winner or you're the loser. These reflect folk music where everyone's voice contributes to the success of the song. One thing that's very challenging about bringing people together to discuss civic issues is that it's best to be neutral when you issue that invitation, and that's hard. The League of Women Voters tries, the library tries, and now Cafe Lena is trying. When we decided last March to screen witness, I. Contrary to what it said in the Times Union, I was informed by tonight's organizers that Tim Cole was associated with the story that we're going to hear. And I was informed that he was planning to run for local office. I explained that Cafe Lena is a nonpartisan organization where people tell their stories so we can gain not just information, but a fuller understanding of the human beings behind the stories. We all agreed that this Peace Week Forum would not be about Tim's candidacy, but rather about the story that is addressed by the film, a story that is part of Tim's record of public service. After the film, anyone in this room who would like to comment or to ask a question about what they've seen and learned will have an equal chance to do so. I thank everyone for coming together to wrangle with hard stuff as a community made up of all different sorts of people who want peace, justice, safety, and health for all. And I'm now going to turn things over to Lynn Jackson, yes, a volunteer activist from Project Salam. And Lynn will be our MC for the evening, thank you. Um, welcome, thank you so much, Cafe Lena, for having us show this movie. Um, I would now like to introduce the director-producer, Masood Haq. Masood graduated from NYU and subsequently received his MFA in documentary film production from CUNY. He has produced and directed several award-winning short-form documentaries, including Stranger in Paradise, which won the top prize at City Vision Film Festival and the jury prize at Jackson Heights Film Festival. Witness is his first feature documentary. Also, Masood Haq is an emergency room physician. So welcome, Masood Haq. Make some comments. Uh, 
Thank you, Lynn. So I want to thank um, Sarah and I want to thank um, uh, Project um, Salam for uh, their invitation and sponsoring this. Um, previous screenings of this uh, film have been in Albany, three of them. They've all been free. They were followed by a uh, open forum, and we like to keep that tradition going. Um, I hope this is not turned into a venue for relitigating the case. The case is done. Those men paid the price. It's over, right? I want to be able to tell their stories. And this is not a place to rehabilitate your, uh, your reputation either. Now, so, the, so the very first question that people often ask me is, why this story? Why tell this story? I think the reason to tell this story is that you can learn everything you need to know about the prosecution of Muslims in this country over the last two decades by understanding the mechanism that we used in this particular film. All right? So there's a recipe to manufacturing a terrorist. And uh, the FBI and the local uh, authorities use that recipe to manufacture two um, terrorists in Albany. What is that recipe? All right? The recipe is very straightforward. You pick on someone who has limited resources, has a long beard and a thick accent, and funny, unpronounceable name. Better if he or she comes from a part of the world which juries might be really suspect of. Second, send in an informant, preferably a really slick guy, right, who talks and talks and talks, record everything, at the end of the day, bring it back to you, edit the sound, and, and get the best bits out for the jury. That's the second part of your recipe. The third one is, have a prop. It's really important to have a prop. A weapon is a really good prop to have for this recipe. Then you need to manufacture some evidence, right? Make something up. But make sure you say that it's a secret evidence so nobody can question it, nobody can challenge it. You can, uh, at the end of your, your, your operation, you can stage a raid. Um, even if it's pointless, just stage it because it's very dramatic, all right? Then, as, the, as you open up to the media, or as, the, as the case is opened up, create a disinformation campaign. Take the very basic facts of somebody's life and uh, redefine them and, and turn them into the other. Lastly, during, a, um, during the trial, keep repeating words or phrases such as secret evidence and predilection because after a while, they will become metaphors for the collect collective Muslim guilt in this country after 9-11. So all of this is done to create a false narrative. And that false narrative, they ride throughout the trial, um, and they ultimately score a conviction. As a filmmaker, it was my task to puncture that false narrative. Right? The most important thing was to show you how they came to frame these two men as terrorists. I hope I did a good job. Um, and uh, you're the ultimate judge of that. Um, Lastly, I just a plug for the film, Witness is available on Amazon Prime. If you just Google Witness a documentary, it should show up. It's only about $3.99. If you like the film, just ask somebody to buy it for me. Thank you so much. What a great film we just saw. I want to thank uh, Cafe Lena again for letting us show this movie and um, this opportunity to further discuss the film with our panel. Um, first, we'll hear from our panelists, and then we will welcome a conversation with you, our audience. There were just two brief rules for the conversation, and that is that uh, please keep your comments and questions short. We only have about 30 minutes to talk, and uh, we'd like to get everyone's comments in. Um, after our, so we're gonna start, after our panelists speak, people will need to come up, we have a microphone here, and so people will need to come up to the microphone. We are recording the panel discussion so other people who aren't here can see it. And um, we're going to uh, record it. So in order to be able to hear your questions, you'll need to come up so that we can, um, can record it. 
I'd like to first introduce Kathy Manley, who is in the movie, of course. Um, Kathy Manley is a criminal attorney working in Albany. Uh, she was one of Yassine's appeal attorneys. She is the legal director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Her main emphasis is criminal defense and constitutional rights. She concentrates on appeals and has written many winning briefs before a variety of courts and has received several awards for her work. And also she and his family in Kurdistan this past January. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks. I'll try to be really quick since I know a lot of you probably have things to say. Um, so I just wanted to update you on a couple things that happened since the film was made and since the men were released. Um, we, with the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, we did study a lot of the other cases and we published a report in 2019 called Inventing Terrorists. Um, Yassin's and Mohammed's was not the only case like this, although it was a particularly bad, <laughs> unfair example. This guy in the middle here is David Williams. He was one of the people entrapped in the Newberg Four case by the same informant, Shahad Hussain, as in this case. And we filed a compassionate release motion for them, which was granted on July 27th. <laughs> and I just, the judge wrote an excellent decision in that case. And I just wanted to read one little part that she said about Shahad Hussain. She said, as was revealed on cross-examination, Hussein engaged repeatedly in activity that constituted various crimes, including bankruptcy fraud, tax evasion, immigration fraud, perjury, and mail fraud. This is the judge saying this from the Newberg case. He lied repeatedly to a laundry list of government agencies from the bankruptcy court for the Northern District of New York to the sentencing judge in his criminal case, his probation officer, the FBI, the INS, the IRS, the State Liquor Authority, and the State Education Department. He even lied on the witness stand at the trial of this case. And the judge actually wrote a letter to the US attorneys up here saying they might want to investigate him for perjury. Um, and then Hussein was the owner of a car for hire business in upstate New York that rented a defective stretch limousine, a vehicle that had been ordered out of service following a safety inspection that hurtled down Route 50, Route 30, sorry, and scary, sending 20, she said 21 innocent people, 20 innocent people to their deaths. And I, I happened upon that memorial recently. And that just really got to me. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention is, is our trip to Kurdistan. It was such a wonderful trip. I went with Lynn and Ala and Steve and my daughter Diana, who's here. And it was so wonderful to see Yassine Free, to meet his whole entire family, to meet so many people, including the governor of Suleimania, um, who gave us lunch. and. Just, it was so amazing, and if anybody ever had anything bad to say about Yassin, they could have sought us out and said it. Nobody did that. They love him. He's such a wonderful person, and it was so great to see him free, and uh, it was just so sad that he missed 15 years of his life, and his family, and Muhammad too, and their children, and their wives, and everybody missed that time with them, and it was wrong. Thank you very much, Kathy. Yeah, this is a little emotional for us. Um, Ala Muhyiddin is Yassin's oldest child, degree, and currently teaches English as a second language to young children. Besides being an excellent teacher, she rescues and fosters kittens. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Ala Muhyiddin, and I'm the daughter of Yassin Araf. I'm going to be reading off my phone. I was going to wing this little spiel, but I decided to write it down on the way here because I was worried I would get tongue-tied. And I'm sorry. I'm going to try to keep this to a few minutes, but I'm sorry if I speak a little longer than the other panelists. This does hit very close to home for me. So forgive me. Um, I've been asked to speak about the personal impact that this has had on my family and my, and I. But before I do that, I'd like to make three brief comments on the case, an observation, an analogy, and an anecdote. This case started by the FBI accusing my father of being a terrorist commander. You watched it in the film. That quickly unraveled when the government was forced to admit the original document into evidence. Kak Yassin had been translated as Commander Yassin, 
when it really meant brother Yassin. The government lied that it was a mistranslation of Arabic when kak is not the Arabic word for commander and in fact is not an Arabic word at all. So when they could no longer run with Yassin being a terrorist commander, the prosecution spent the trial hiding behind secret evidence and was apparently trying to allude that the secret evidence directly linked my dad to terrorism or even prove that he was a terrorist without directly making that accusation. When the trial wasn't going in their favor, the prosecutor had to state in court that my dad wasn't accused of being a terrorist, only of his participation in the sting, except dad never knew about a plot. When dad was convicted, all was said and done and the dust has settled and the prosecution was interviewed. The US attorney told the media that the US had no evidence that Yassin was a terrorist, but he had the ideology. What was the ideology? Dad has never, ever supported terrorism. So his ideology was his beard, his daily prayers, his charity giving, his selflessness. This may be presumptuous, but I think I speak for more than myself when I say Americans don't want the FBI telling us what ideologies we can and cannot have. <laughs> guys. Second, I want to give an analogy. I'm not a lawyer, but this is how I see it. This was supposed to be a sting operation, or as my dad would say it, a sitting operation. <laughs> Just Iraqish things. In a normal sting operation, something happens along the line of an undercover agent pretending to want to buy drugs and a drug dealer selling it to them and getting caught. In this case, the drugs were made by the government. They weren't even real, they were fake drugs. The government kept trying to push the drugs down people's throats, even when they stated they didn't want that. Like when my dad and Musharraf Hussein said they didn't support terrorism and wanted to follow the law, and the informant proclaimed he was doing nothing illegal. What in this world is legal? And the government arrested them, even when they didn't want to take the drugs, or even if they didn't know As my father was never made aware of a plot. Third, Oh. I want to tell an anecdote of the exhilarating time my dad was released from ICE detention and arrived in Kurdistan. I'm not exaggerating when I say we had hundreds or even thousands of guests to welcome my father back. We had so many guests that when a group of guests arrived, another group had to stand up to leave to make room for them. Constantly, there was two people at the sink washing dishes, two people at the stove preparing tea, and two people serving. My sister is raising her hand. It, it was her duty, I was teaching at a university. For weeks, this was our life. From morning to night, we just had guests, and it continued for months to a lesser extent. All of these people, all that thought that my dad being associated with terrorism was the most ridiculous, outrageous, egregious thing they've ever heard of. And I remember thinking to myself, if my dad was a terrorist, wouldn't one of these people who grew up with him, who knew him the best, wouldn't one of these people know? As for the impact this had on my family, I honestly cannot exaggerate or overstate the devastation that this has caused to us. 15 years might sound light compared to what others have faced, like, um, the Holy Land Foundation facing life, but it impacted every aspect and day of our lives. I was eight years old when my dad was imprisoned, and I'm the oldest child. My mother became ridden with debilitating and crippling ailments that left her in constant pain, and she was unable to care for us the, one she, the way she wanted to as much as she tried. She was also deeply untrusting of the government as she couldn't understand how the same government that went on a witch hunt against her husband could simultaneously offer us food stamps and Medicaid. So she refused that. I'll give one example out of countless of how this affected me. I have a condition called hydrocephalus, which means that there is an obstruction in the ventricles of my brain that prevent fluid from draining adequately. The pressure in my brain was high enough to kill an average person, and my brain was extremely swollen. I'm not going to go into the symptoms, but there were many, and they were debilitating and all engulfing. 
the biggest problem was that since I didn't have insurance, I never went to the doctors and I was undiagnosed. I had also become accustomed to the symptoms and it never occurred to me that a condition with my brain was what was causing them. When I was an adult and I was experiencing episodes of blindness is when I finally went to the ER thinking something was wrong with my retinas. Actually, the problem was much, more, much worse, and I had to have two brain surgeries and multiple other operations to treat it. It may seem like this has nothing to do with my dad's absence, but if we had a dad, I would have never been put in the position where I hadn't been to the doctors in a decade, and I would have had a chance to get the scans and tests and have been able to treat my condition before it got as bad as it did. There are millions of these examples. My sister, who's sitting right here in the front row, was born when my dad was in prison and she never got a chance to have a meal with her whole family until she was 12 years old. I don't know if there's gonna be another chance for us to all have a meal together since my parents are living in another country thousands of miles away. It goes on and on. No part of our lives were normal. My childhood ended the day when my dad was in prison. Thanks guys. Um, I'd like to introduce Jean Finley. Jean is a writer, editor, and photographer living in Albany. Her photos have been displayed in many exhibits, including the Albany Institute of History and Art, in an extensive collection called Descent in Albany. She edited Yasin's book, Son of Mountains. I highly recommend you read that. Um, the book's name is Son of Mountains, My Life as a Kurd and a Terror Sus Suspect. You can buy that in um, Apple's iBooks. And um, also Shamshad's, Shamshad Ahmad's book about his case, Rounded Up. And we did have some copies um, of Rounded Up out, out on the, the table with the, uh, the band merch. Um, and if, if there's any left, you can have one of those. If you'd like another one, I'm sure Jean could supply one. Um, so Jean, thank you so much. All right, you can move that up. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much. I think Allah is a pretty hard act to follow. <laughs> but she's always been a hard act to follow. Um, yes, the books are free. They're available on the table. Um, they are, there are, there are fewer and fewer of them. Unfortunately, we only have a few copies of uh, Yasin's book, Son of Mountains. Um, but you can still purchase that through Amazon or, m more importantly, the Troy Bookmakers. Um, if you're interested, go to that site uh, and you will see that. Um, Sham Dr. Shamshad Ahmad's book, it, I brought that because it really is uh, a good timeline and kind of the definitive statement about the case. He also listened to hundreds of hours of the sting tapes and did a transcription of them and that is the appendix in that book. So if you would like to get a Muslim viewpoint, which really is what this case was all about, um, read that book. Um, I'm gonna cut a little bit of this short here. There were quotes. I like to uh, pull out quotes because with an editor's mind, I say, ah, oh, that, that, that. And I think we've all picked up um, on, the, on the quote from the uh, U.S. attorney, um, and I believe the, the special agent in charge um, after, uh, on the press conference uh, after the convictions, uh, where a reporter asks directly, is Yassin Araf a terrorist? And the answer, and I would like you to roll this over in your head and never forget it. This is the U.S. attorney and the agent in charge. Well, we didn't have the evidence of that. But he had the ideology. We didn't have the evidence of that. 
And there's another quote that I want to bring to your attention, which isn't in the film. I thought it would be. I was remembering having seen the film before. It was James Comey in August 2004 at the uh, press conference in Washington, D.C., where uh, the arrests were <laughs> announced. And it happened a little bit after the clip that, that was shown, uh, or the part that was, that was shown um, in the film. And uh, that, uh, sorry, I, I'm looking at my, my notes here. Um, what he's, he was asked, certainly by the reporters there who were pretty skeptical or at least wanting more information, but more information, as you saw, was not forthcoming. I can't talk about that. Um, he said, prompted by no one, get this quote in your head too, no terrorist activity took place. And so for 20 years, I think my, the, the group here, including family, has said, then why are these men in prison? Um, I think we can deduce from the prosecution of Yassin, because the case was all about Yassin, um, what the recipe was. Uh, Masood uh, referred to the recipe for um, prosecution. 9-11, hysteria about Muslims. Something that we really need to remember, by 2003, which is when the sting really began, there was war fever in this country. Remember that we were going to invade Iraq and we ultimately did? Yes, is an Iraqi Kurd. Kurd may or may not be important, but Iraqi was. According to the uh, FBI website, quote, the first JTTF, Joint Terrorism Task Force, was established in New York City in 1980. Today, there are about 200 task forces around the country, including at least one in each of the FBI's 56 field offices, such as Albany, with hundreds of participating state, local, and federal agencies, unquote. So each JTTF, post 9-11, with war fever raging, needed to be shown to be doing its job and earning its funding. <laughs> Here are the elements for predisposition, borne out by hundreds of similar prosecutions since the Arab Hossein case um, in 2004. First, you gotta be Muslim. Being male helps. They didn't go to the Episcopal Church to troll for terrorists. The assumption, all Muslims are potential terrorists by dint of their religion. I do think we have a constitution in the country with the First Amendment, it's first line, not freedom of speech, remember folks? It's not freedom of speech, it's freedom of religion. You need to be an immigrant, preferably a recent immigrant, because you don't have too many permanent connections. You need to be somewhat vulnerable uh, in, in some way, either have a mental health issue, uh, poverty, uh, addiction of some kind. You need to be religious, especially if you're Muslim, since the assumed predisposition to radicalization and potential violence. And you need to be politically active, either in the old country or here, or both, and willing to actually do something about the cause you espouse. Now, I would wager that a great number of you in this audience are politically active, correct? <laughs> uh, so think about how these categories apply to Yassin, an imam, a new US resident, very politically active during the Kurdish uprising in the 1990s, and he later worked to help uh, Kurds immigrate from uh, the starvation that was going on in Kurdistan um, and helping them get to Europe. We've seen a lot of that going on now, who's helping the immigrants who are starving and in poverty and leaving their countries move to Europe. Um, it's important to note that he came to the U.S. as a U.N. refugee in 1999, two years before 
And the last point I'd, I'd like to bring out, he's also a writer and a poet. And his poetry, as well as his journals, were used as evidence against him at trial. I'm an artist, art as evidence. If you're an artist, think about it. Thank you, Jim. Did you? You're, you're good? Okay. Um, I want to uh, thank our panelists for speaking. Um, we're going to open it up in a minute to uh, have a conversation. And if people want to speak, they'll have to come up to the microphone here. I'm hoping maybe someone from Cafe Lena could adjust the microphone so we could get it on a, a stand properly. It's really uh, going to be best to just hold it. Oh, just hold it? Okay. All right, um, so we have, uh, we're not quite, people can line up if they'd like to speak, but um, Jean has just some questions to think about, right? I'm sure all of you have lots of questions, and I don't want to at all get in the way of that. Um, I just wanted to ask, how many of you followed the trial in 2004? Okay, and how many of you, uh, this is new information to you? It was a fair representation. Do you think ev every point was touched, or was it a bias? Did you feel it was biased? And, and feel yeah, free. The film. Uh, the, the film itself. <laughs> the film itself. I felt it was biased. Bias. <laughs> yeah. Bias. Bias. Sure. Speak into the microphone. Okay. okay. Yeah, you people are gonna have to speak into the microphone. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, just to remind you, keep your uh, questions short and um, speak into the microphone, which I see uh, Mr. Cole already has. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> you know, uh, I listened to this presentation for over two hours, and I did so very respectfully, so I asked the audience to please listen to me with respect. I would appreciate that. First thing to, to Mr. Hawk. Uh, you started off and, and what you said is you didn't want to relitigate the Yasina Ref case. And this was two hours of relitigating the Yasina Ref case. No, it was telling their story. It was Which, telling the story. The story from the defense. Relitigation attorneys. is what you're doing right now. You're going to relitigate it for them because you're running for office. I'm telling them a story of what happened to two Muslim men. It is my right to do that. I disagree with you. You're playing transcripts, things like that. Let me, let me, just, yeah. let me just answer another question. Let me just state another fact. Um, you know, I have a 30-year record in the FBI. I've worked on terrorism cases. White, I've worked on terrorism cases. I've worked on public corruption cases. I've arrested Republicans, Democrats, drug dealers. I have a stellar reputation. <laughs> So I, don't, I find it um, disingenuous when you say I'm coming here to repair my reputation. My, my only reputation I have of all the people I have rest, arrested is the defendants don't like me. Well, you're the one who's getting up here and trying to relitigate this, so I don't really understand right. what it is that you're trying to do. Yep. What, what exactly are you trying to do, right? So you I, saw I, the I, film I, for I, two I, hours, you yep. came as an audience, you've started a public campaign to come and hijack this event. I'm, Where do you get off? Where do you get off? Fair enough. I'm, 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 here, I'm here to give a, a rebuttal to, to the public it event. Is, it is not a rebuttal thing. You have a question, ask the question. Ask the question. Ask the question. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask a question. One question to Kathy Manley. Apology not accepted. Uh, so let me, let me just read a quote from Yasina Ref's diary. And in your, in your rebuttal, uh, I want you to explain it, because in, in your rebuttal, you said that he never, dis he never discussed this. Today I met Brother Abdu, Abdu Sadiq. He is from Libya. He came with a Palestinian brother to my house. They seem to be clever in Mujahid. May Allah protect them. We talked about the following points. 
Strive to move the war to America and Israel. Make the explosions there. Attacking Western targets so we can get the people's attention toward us. We talked about the following points. It was in the film. They saw it. Yeah. Right. They saw it. I'm Kathy you know Manby. I'm going to answer your question. Yeah. Well, the I, reason I, I, for I'm this at, is, I'm, no, I'm gonna, no, no, you, I'm I'm gonna ask, answer, I'm I could ask your question. I'm going to answer the question. Yes. What happens is you guys become experts at everything. You got a Muslim uh, uh, guy arrested. Suddenly, you know everything about Middle East. You know, when we grow up in Middle East, Jews are never hated for their religion. It is always through a colonial perspective. We think of them as occupying forces. We do not think of them that those stereotypes, they're yours. All the stereotypes about anti-Semitic stereotypes, they're yours. They're not our stereotypes. Well, let me respond to that. Uh, um, it's a, uh, next, Cole. anyone else has a question? You know what, let him, let him. Mr. Cole. I, I, I was told, Cole? I was told tonight I could, sp I could speak no, and no, give no, a rebuttal. Yeah, Mr. Uh, no yes. one told you that. Uh, uh, Kat, what, listen, Kathy, please. I said it was up to Lynn for how long? You've had four minutes. I, I haven't and talked yet. I get interrupted for four minutes. No. I, I wasn't told a question. I was told I could give a rebuttal for three to five minutes. I'll give you two more minutes, and then that's it. Because there are a lot of other people here. This is about the okay. movie. Yes. Okay, two more minutes. The time starts now. It's 9.08. Okay, so I have two minutes. Mohammed Hussein and Yassin Aref were found guilty by a unanimous jury in Albany. <clears throat> right? The, uh, the case was affirmed by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Homer said, a ref espouses terrorism and has ongoing relationships with terrorists in the Middle East. That's the quote from the last detention hearing. Judge McAvoy, McAvoy Kathy Manley, Judge McAvoy stated, the FBI had good and valid reasons to target Yasina Ref. And you know what? The defense attorneys agreed to that statement. It was a stipulation. They agreed to that. It was a stipulation. Judge McAvoy actually made that statement to the jury during their deliberations, which some would consider jury tampering. Yeah, it was a stipulation because otherwise we were forced to, to deal with you putting in the evidence and us not being able to ask a single question because it was classified. As soon as it was classified, there was nothing we could do. We were blindfolded. We had no chance of winning against that. Convicted on secret evidence and the appeal was won on secret evidence that nobody could refute. The idea that just because they were convicted that the crime actually happened is laughable. It's totally laughable. You manipulate. You manipulated the evidence. Yeah. You, had, you had the choice of what to present the jury, which snippets to play. You, man, you created it. I, always, I admire you. I think you would be a really good filmmaker. Because I think you know what to, where to cut, where, where to, how to make the narrative happen. Make and I think the that's... Evidence public. Let's okay, the so, evidence. so there was 75 recordings in this case. Every single meeting was recorded, provided to the jury. Right? There was no okay. snippets. The jury, the, the defense attorney had the right to play every tape, just like the government did. Except for the one he conveniently lost. Lost. I think, I think. Okay. Nope. Okay, I'll allow a question. Yes, you could, yes, you could answer. Well, can, can I finish my uh, three-minute statement? Well, she, wait, okay, who, who, who is the moderator here? Who's the moderator? Okay, can, I, I was told I can give a three to five. No, I, I understand, but... Had, it is 9-11, you had... Oh, you, you want me to answer a question or two? 9-11, it's 9-11. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to sit down and say, look, with all due respect, there's a different side to this story. So thank you, Mr. Paul, please sit down. We have, thank you. We have, please sit down. Jean has a question. I, I have a question for Mr. Cole. Oh, and it <laughs> wouldn't let me talk. Oh, oops, Our maybe I did something wrong. Never mind. But you only get two minutes to Never. answer. What's your two question? Two minutes to answer, okay. It's a rhetorical question, perhaps, that we all want to say. 
don't you think it's time after 20 years that you release the classified evidence? <laughs> they were convicted, they did their time, they're home, it's finished, we're over. Can't we release that evidence? So uh, just to educate the public, the Classified Information Procedures Act, it's called SEPA. Kathy Manley is very, very familiar with it. Sadly. Sadly, apparently. But in any event, the classified information only is available to the defense if the information is helpful to the defense. They don't get to see the classified information, only it's as helpful to the defense. The, the judge, judge decides the that. The judge but decides if that. That's if the law in the United States of America. If it's false you can evidence, only help the then we don't get to, That's the law. Then we don't get to show it's false because we don't get to see it. The judge isn't going to investigate it and discover that it's false. Like when they claimed Yassin was a man named Mohammed Yassin in Al-Qaeda who died in 2010. Shit. Or if it's an imaginary, um, you know, stuff that they just came up with, manufactured evidence. That's what it is. I mean, the okay. FBI well, like couldn't... The, uh, like the cock uh, scene. Yeah, they couldn't uh, translate cock uh, So we have another uh, audience Yeah, just a, a very quick uh, <clears throat> comment, finally. Um, you know, when it comes to jury trials, of course, the jury found the, uh, the Klan innocent of killing Emmett Till. <laughs> At any rate, uh, the first comment made by Masood was not to... Uh, was not to uh, relitigate this. But what we see, the very first thing that we see is a relitigation of the case, including the usual sort of fraudulent argument. Can you honestly write and type this, Tim? A ref's extensive history with terrorists and terrorist organizations. Absurd. But uh, I, I think the key thing is the movie ended with something that leaves a question. Where is the FBI investigation of Malik? The FBI, with Tim Cole, paid him an awful lot of money. Limo. He bought a limo service. It killed 20 people. Malik got heart surgery here, and the FBI allowed him to escape, for health reasons, to Pakistan. So if anything, I would say, these people of the FBI are involved in a RICO corrupt. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll respond. Um, okay. No, no, no. You've had enough. You've had enough. We have another audience member here, please. I, I appeared briefly in the film, if any of you remember. I covered... I... I... I I, I covered the trial exhaustively. Um, it became a large part of my life. Um, I've covered a lot of trials in my day. I've never seen the like of this one for absolute, utter, utter lack of unconvincing, unconvincing evidence. And I must say, as a reporter, when Comey announced in Washington that a couple of terrorists had been caught in Albany, it was a thrilling day for me. There was nothing I would like more in Albany as a reporter than a couple of genuine terrorists. And I and other reporters were delighted. Here is a great story. Here is something we can get on. I did not come into this. I had no reason whatsoever to believe that these guys were innocent. I got to know them a little bit. I sat through the trial. I listened to the whole thing. And at the end, it was nothing but embarrassing. It was the most embarrassing trial I'd ever sat through. The evidence was laughable. I'm not going to attempt to relitigate it. And since then, I got to know both, both Mohammed Hussein and Yassin Aref. They are two of the nicest, most honorable men I've ever met. They are the farthest thing in the world from, from, from terrorists. I can, I'll, stake, I'll stake my life on that. Why, why don't you talk about when Tim Cole came with, with, with Paracheck to you? When Tim Cole yeah. came with Paracheck, do you have a photograph of that and tried to intimidate you into not writing those columns? They, 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 they sent a delegation after the trial was all over, and, and they had won. The FBI had won. They got a, uh, they got a jury verdict. Uh, Tim Cole, along with, I forgot his name, Pikus, whatever it was. Bill Paracheck. Paracheck. And uh, Sotheby, was Sotheby well, there? Only, it was him and... Uh, yeah, a, a delegation. I'm going to help you. It was Glenn Sotheby, the U.S. attorney. 
who is now a judge. Pikus, head of the FBI office. And Bill Parachek. And Bill Parachek uh, came to the Gazette to, after the thing was all over, after they'd already won, for an editorial board meeting, that is with me and my bosses, to denounce me for my reporting, every word, almost every word of which I will stand by to this day. And they didn't say they wanted me fired, but that could have been the only possible reason for it. That is their commitment to the truth. If you have any comments or questions stand, about this segment or any others, please visit us at lawandisorder.org. That's lawandisorder.org. One word, lawandisorder.org. We, we sat through it. We saw it. We have another audience member here, please. We have another. Hello. Uh, this is going to take it in kind of a different direction. Okay. And I was just going to ask you this um, afterwards, but then I thought, well, maybe other people might want to know. Did your dad get his kidney transplant? It was said. Damn it! I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> He didn't get the transplant yet. He still needs it, but um, he gets dialysis. Yeah, he gets dialysis. dialysis. Yeah. Okay. He and he had also had heart attack, stroke. He heart has a lot of health problems. Recently. Heart surgery recently. I really was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. We have another audience member here. And this first question is for Masood. The second is for anybody. Um, and you've all really excuse me, spoken to the second, but I'd like to hear more of what your thoughts are. So the first was what um, drew you to make this film. And then the second is, you talked a lot in the beginning about how to create a terrorist. Why would the US, the legal system, whoever you want to talk about, um, want to do that? So, uh, Thank you so much. Those are excellent questions. I get asked this question all the time. I truly believe that there's just a, just a few degrees difference between me and Mohammed Hussein and Yasin Arif. Tim Cole could have come after me. He could have come after me, except that I'm, I'm more educated. I had more financial resources. I could have gotten a much better lawyer. I would have never spoken to FBI without a lawyer in the room. Um, so I, I really feel like it could have been me. And, and there, were, there were doctors who were dragged into these things. There were professionals. There were all sorts of people. So through their story, I'm kind of telling a, my own story in this country of having to live through that era of, of constant suspicion. Um, and to the other uh, point that um, was asked, um, I think they got so much money after, through the Patriot Act and after 9-11, they didn't know what to do with it. They really didn't know what to do with it because it, it, it wasn't really smart stuff they were doing, you know? They were just, they were going to do sting operations, this glamorous stuff. Tim Cole was going to be interviewed about stuff like this. He had this background from Queens of getting the mafia people in. He brought the same stuff in. He was going to write everything so that it was airtight. And, and so, you know, they, they, had, they needed to justify their existence. And this is the result of their justifying their existence. Thank you. Um, okay, so the question is, what happened to the other children in the families? So should I, you want to talk about? Sure, everybody is doing well out of the children. Um, everybody is here in the States, everybody is doing well health-wise. <laughs> Everybody is either in college or married or beginning their careers, and we're all doing well. We're all so thankful for your support. Um, thank you so much for sticking by us from day one and not letting this story go unheard and not letting us be forgotten. You're everything. Thank you. Thank, I, I'll just, I'll just add one, one point. Um, her brother Salah um, went to Harvard Law School and is now working as a lawyer um, in New York City. And he was my intern for one summer during the pandemic in 2020. And he helped get somebody else released on compassionate release. We have another question. Yes, yes, question, yes. 
Thank you. Thank you for putting together this documentary. When I first watched it at home, it really did bring back, I remember I called my parents and I said, you've got to watch this because it really brings back that time period. And what we were experiencing both when this case was going on, I mean, I remember very viscerally reacting to what was happening and following the case at the time. And so thank you, um, because it is an important reminder of what happened during that time. And I guess my question is maybe for you, Kathy, but for anybody, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge today um, that is an equivalent in terms of the targeting, in terms of sort of the specious attacks, because this is not new. It wasn't the first time this happened. It's certainly not the last. But where do you think the focus is now in terms of what we can do to um, fight against this kind of injustice and also, you know, support groups like yours or, or just, you know, where do you see it today? Well, maybe somebody else could, could uh, in too, but I mean, I'll just talk about in, entrapment, about sting cases, because this is a model that, that works very well for the FBI, as you can see. They can convict totally innocent people in these sting cases sometimes, and part of that is because there is no real entrapment defense anymore, because the judge tells the jury that if the targets have a what they call a ready response to an offer of money or some kind of manipulation or what they call inducement, if they agreed to do something, which actually Yassine never did, so that's, he, he, did, he wasn't even really entrapped because he didn't even know anything illegal was going on, so that's kind of an outlier in that sense. But in general, with these sting cases, people do say bad things on the tapes, Yassine didn't. Um, and if they don't back out of the plot, if they respond to the, the offer of, in some cases, $250,000, and agree to do something like in the Newberg 4 case where they just wanted the money and they had no intent to support terrorism and they had no history of it, they were not predisposed. If they don't back out, then they're, then they're gonna be considered guilty. That's what the judge tells the jury is that you should convict them because by responding to an offer of $250,000 by saying, oh, okay, I could use that money, that's considered predisposition under the law. So that's a huge problem, and that's one of the things that needs to be changed because these sting cases, they've been used against Muslims a lot, and they're still being used against Muslims, but they're starting to be used against all sorts of other groups too, whoever the government wants to go after at any time, right wing, left wing, whatever, different immigrant group, any, anybody that they want to use it against. And so I think that's just one thing that needs to be changed. And also the classified evidence should be given to the defense counsel so we can confront the evidence against us. So, I mean, there's a lot of injustice, but those are just two examples that would have made a big difference in this case that I'd like to see changed. But, but also there are still many um, men, mostly men, some women, who are incarcerated for very long periods of time in cases like this. There's the Fort Dix Five case. And that case is interesting because one of the members of the Fort Dix Five actually called the police on the informant. So he only got 30 years. The other four men got life in prison. Three brothers. And, and, there's, and three of them are brothers. The families are devastated. There's, there's um, what's that? Plus 30 years. Oh, yeah, plus 30 years for gun charges. At any rate, and then there's the Holy Land Foundation, who those people, the men there, gave uh, raised money for charity. Um, of course, it was charity in Palestine, so you can imagine what happened to them. And some of them are in prison for 65 years. These are men in their, you know, the, the, they won't ever get out. Um, and there are other cases. There's Afia Siddiqui's case. Um, we have a database of these cases, and we have over 1,200 cases in our database right now. Uh, so even though we look at this maybe as being in the past, it's, it's not in the past. These men and these families are still suffering. Oh, we have another question from the audience. So I want to thank all of you. And really, I, I don't know how you can be so calm. And so I, I just really appreciate that it takes so much courage. I just can't even imagine. And I want to thank you for speaking up and elevating this story. And Masood, this film is, is excellent. And I think, you know, just a comment. I think one of the ways that you can tell, two of the ways that you can tell this film is powerful. One, all of our strong, well, some of our strong reactions while it was going on. And two, if you create art that has such an impact that a person in power goes to great lengths to try to hijack your event, you're doing the right thing. When can we see another film? Is there another project in the works? 
totally preoccupied with supporting my family at this point. So <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Um, are there any other comments from the audience? Um, I, I would like to make a couple comments because we have a little extra time. Um, so six of us did go to Kurdistan well, and with Ala, and we met Yasin Arif, and Carl went, um, and Carl's wife. So there were six of us, and um, I. So I have, um, you know, I okay. So. I came from a background of environmentalism, trying to save the pine bush, butterfly, sand dunes. That's my, what I used to do. And I never thought I would be involved in something that, that was like this. Um, I had no passport. And so to go to Kurdistan, because I'd never been out of the country before. So my very first trip out of the country was to Iraqi Kurdistan, <laughs> which <laughs> makes perfect sense to me, but it does seem a little absurd to other people. At any rate, I just want to say that it was overwhelming. I had never, of course, because of our, our, our system, I had never actually met Yasin in person. I had, you know, tried to support his family and, you know, organized events, you know, for him and all this kind of thing. I talked to him on the phone, wrote letters to him, but never met him in person. Um, except I actually, when he was in ICE detention, uh, I met him through glass in a jail and I could hardly hear anything he said. But at any rate, so to meet him in person and to see him in his element was really absolutely fascinating to me. And if I wasn't upset before I went to see him about what the government did to him, I was really upset when I came back because to see him in his element and to understand you know, what Kurdistan was like, during that 10-day visit, we visited three museums of genocide that had happened in Yassin's, you know, where he lived. Um, Anfal, uh, the Cham Chamal, and uh, the Saddam Hussein's prison. It was, it was horrible. And we, we saw, we, and then that was, that was the difficult part. But the wonderful part was we met all these people. Everyone wanted to meet us. And it was wonderful. Of course, I spoke not a word of Kurdish. And most of the people we met didn't speak any English. But they were wonderful people. And some of the people I met, I just wanted to like sit with because they were just such nice people. And, and I don't know, like, I, real, I feel like coming back here that my hospitality is quite limited. In Kurdistan, the hospitality was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Everywhere we went, people served us tea, and they talked to us, and they gave us sweets and, and food and more food and more food. And, and we went to, we actually met the governor of Suleimania, which really totally blew my mind. I thought, well, you know, he's a governor, right? I mean... Maybe we'd talk to him for 15 minutes. Not only that, so we're sitting there, and um, he said, well, would you like to come to lunch? And it, it was like, so his, his uh, people drove us to one of the museums, and we were at the museum, and then we met, we went to the bazaar for lunch. It was, he spent a couple hours with us. It was amazing. I mean, and Yassine knows all these people, and it was, it was a fabulous experience. So I just wanted to mention that. Is there any other comments from the, the yeah. I always promise myself to not speak, but it's really hard. First, thank you, everyone that has worked so hard to bring out the truth. Carl, you've always written. I've read your stuff for many years. The truth is what you are after. The truth is what everyone is after, and the truth is not what we're getting to in our country. Um, there seems to be just lie after lie after lie. And my question to um, the panel is, how do we get to that? How do we get to truth and justice as opposed to right and wrong? Um, we, you're doing, you did a great job with this movie. I, I mean, it brought me to tears. I knew of the story. I didn't know, I didn't know the depth. When that first happened, I felt that uh, something just doesn't seem right. They're making pizza. How could these guys be wrong and involved in this? And it, it appears that with many incidents in our country, the court system, the police, kind of all the way up to the, to the judges are tainted with not necessarily finding out the truth, but just making someone wrong and making themselves right. And they won't back down from that. How can we 
change that narrative. Your movie's a great start, but any advice from those who are working on peace and justice? So I, I will give you just one example. Uh, Justin Trudeau accused uh, Modi's government of assassinating a Sikh in um, uh, Canada. As this is playing out on the world stage, the, the, the world power, America, can't raise its eyes, can't say anything about it. Because for the last two decades, that's exactly what we have been doing. We've been doing it in all over the Middle East. We're kidnapping people. We were assassinating people. So when Modi's government does it in Canada, how can Joe Biden say anything about it? The only way you will fix this is if you fix these institutions. If they, if they, if they start to do public service and stop doing self-service. I think I've seen the film now, I think this is the sixth time because <laughs> we, <laughs> no, every time it is different and every time I see something else and this time, this time I choked up a couple of times and I think part of it is that it's now, let's, let's be generous here, 20 years. We've been at this since 2006. I was very active against feudally, as a billion other people were feudally against the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Before that, I had helped uh, a, local, a local woman, a Muslim woman, um, with a domestic violence uh, issue. 20 years, we're all Older, <laughs> oh God, say that bad word. And yet, here we are. And we're here because you keep putting one foot in front of the other and you keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and raising your voice and going to a demonstration and having things like this. And you keep looking at films and you keep talking to people, and you keep acting collectively. And that's how you change. You don't change from the top down, you change from the bottom up. It takes a long time. Some of us who are a little older than the rest of you, uh, you know, it's going to take a lifetime, and then we hand it off to you because we're going to be gone. But that's how you do it. Am I sorry? Hell no. <laughs> Do it again. Any, any more comments from the audience? Any more questions, comments? Well, it's 9.35. We, um, uh, I, we, have, a, we have a closing uh, comment. Mr. Cole, this is a response to your comment in the press that you were being treated unfairly by not being able to speak for the amount of time that you deemed as appropriate. When you and your team spent weeks viciously attacking my father's character in court, trying to give the impression that he was a terrorist or sympathetic to terrorism, and he didn't get a chance to respond to your lies, that was unfair. When he only got one day on the witness stand and you got three, that was unfair. When you got to choose what you spoke about on the witness stand, but my dad didn't get to give his side of everything that was being alleged against him, that was unfair. When your team hid evidence and the defense didn't get a chance to rebuke something that they never saw, that was unfair. You are not the voiceless one. You were not the persecuted one. You're on the side of the unfair. You're not a victim of it. This hetero thank privileged you so much. white man. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, thank you. Just kidding, kind of.